Thank you very much, everybody, and I hope um, I will actually keep it relatively um, short because uh, I think everybody would like to have a nice lunch, and um, it, certainly I will. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm Mo uh, I'm Mona, and I'm the director of Access. I'm not sure whether uh, Anson Seal already told a little bit about Access. Uh, I think uh, I will add a little bit on that. So we have uh, established access as an association of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in Singapore. Um, and we, 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 we try to establish best practices. We try to get the word out about, you know, what B Bitcoin is all about, what blockchain is all about, and, uh, and, you know, how to not to abuse Bitcoin and or the blockchain technology, but actually really, if you're interested in it, that you can come to our workshops and that you can actually, uh, you know, ask questions. Uh, if you are a developer, you can, you, you can ask questions about how to go about it, uh, what's already established there, um, share best practices so far and stuff like that. So that's a little bit about access. That was about access. Then let's talk about, um, why we are here. So from 2008 onwards, um, there were more than enormous accelerations of investment from venture capitalists in fintech companies. And the question is really, why did it happen? Why did it happen from 2008 onwards to 2014 that so many uh, venture capitalists actually were really investing into fintech companies? and especially the last couple of years. So how, how did that all happen? So a lot of it has already been explained, so I'm going quickly through the, those slides. So back in 2008, the global financial crisis happened, and a lot of people were, of course, not happy with the financial system. So they were pretty much like, you know, nobody had a job, Wall Street was empty, and they thought, the financial system as it is, and as it already exists for quite a few years, is not really that reliable anymore, because, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be in this situation. So a lot of those ex-bankers, more or less, also started to think about different ways to actually uh, deregulate, but also decentralize, what already has been mentioned before as well, and see whether there are other ways to self Central, so self regulate yourself and also whether there are other ways to actually not be um, centralized by a central bank or by a middleman, but, but to be honest, to, to arrange it yourself. So, what you already heard as well, there was a guy called uh, Santosha Nakamoti, nobody knows who he really was, or whether it was a group of people or not, but at least he came up with this whole Bitcoin protocol, which was totally different, totally new. And then the question was, of course, what what was Bitcoin all about? Well, a lot of it is that it is a digital means to transfer value. And it was the digital part was, of course, totally new, because until up until then, everybody knew about, you know, currencies like dollars and, and, and euros and stuff like that, and physical currencies, but not through the internet. Uh, but the more important thing was, was that the blockchain technology that's underlying the Bitcoin uh, currency was actually uh, even more important because that's a distributed ledger that actually really records yeah, records every transaction. So the way it works, and I really simplified it, is that the computer sends out a block into the network, and uh, the network validates that block. And then um, once it is validated, it will be actually put into the uh, in, into a chain, which you know then is 
uh, accepted as you know the blockchain and then automatically the money transferred from A to B so very simply said there is no middleman there is nobody else involved it just goes from A to B however although this technology is really great and etc um, there were also quite a few scandals um, involved because what already is mentioned before as well is that uh, it is very easy to transfer the, the Bitcoin or uh, use blockchain technology because it's an open source. However, uh, because it's so easy to use it, everybody can use it. I mean, people uh, who, don't, who don't want to you know, do great stuff or people with criminal intention can use that system as well because it's an open system. Uh, you just have to have an internet address and you, ha you have to have a mobile phone or another device, computer, and you can just, you know, go online. So there have been quite a few of scandals, but the funny part is, and that's what I'm really uh, am here for, is that through the years, the technology has changed quite a bit. And although there were quite some scandals, the technology actually really helped to aid in actually catching the bad guys as well. And I will get to that a little bit later. But one of the things is that everybody thought that Bitcoin was really anonymous. Whereas I will show you later in the video that there are startups and companies who are actually really looking into that to aid um, financial services, but also aid um, uh, other organizations to actually help to get into the investigation and to help to get the criminals uh, because of the whole Bitcoin technology. So from a regulatory point of view, and we already talked about that for quite a few times as well, um, there are of course still a lot of challenges because this whole technology is relatively new, which already is mentioned before as well. Um, the challenges is much, are much more in the space that, you know, the scalability issues, it is internet based, so it, it, it goes everywhere and cross border. Uh, there are different countries who have different rules and regulations in place. In some countries, you can do certain stuff and you can deal in certain uh, uh, transactions. Other countries, you cannot. So how do you deal with that? How do you, in a way, regulate it? How do you make sure that, that, that everybody is happy with with the way the transactions are organized and and and, and trusted in a, in a way so besides that um, it is still relatively uh, well known by a relatively small group of people I'm, I'm not sure whether we are here all blockchain and Bitcoin experts but a lot of people there in the mainstream don't even really know what it's all about um, and, and and therefore because they don't know they don't trust it and it will be difficult to apply, right? So the other thing is, like I already said before, because it is cheap and smooth and very accessible, it is also very interesting for people who, you know, who are interested in criminal activities. So let me show now, because this is what I'm here for. Let me show now that actually a lot of companies at the moment worldwide, not only uh, in Asia, but also in the US and, and the UK, are trying to come up with, uh, with, you know, uh, with technology from the blockchain related to actually help financial institutions or help investigation co uh, companies to get the crooks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Jonathan Reem, one of the co-founders of Chainalysis. Um, how many people here have heard of uh, Bitcoin? Okay. How many people have heard of Mt. Gox? Okay, basically the same people. Um, so all of you um, might know that Mt. Gox, uh, which was the largest Bitcoin exchange, went bankrupt. Um, we were the official investigators into where that money went. Um, we are now the leading anti-money laundering provider and KYC provider in the Bitcoin space. Um, I'm going to show you exactly uh, what we do. How many people think that Bitcoin is anonymous? 
Okay, so I don't need to dispel that rumor. Um, it is not anonymous, and I'll, let me show you what we do. Um, typically, we have four types of clients. We have Bitcoin businesses who are regulated in the United States. We have banks who give bank accounts to Bitcoin businesses. We have cyber threat intelligence companies. And then we also have law enforcement customers. So without further ado, no matches. Okay. Um, so essentially, this is our enhanced due diligence platform. We also have an API that sits behind this. What I'm showing you here is a summary of Kraken, the exchange, and all the activity that Kraken um, has ever done on the blockchain. My co-founder, Michael, was one of the co-founders at Kraken. And what we're able to do, which people are kind of amazed about in Bitcoin, is that we can show how Kraken has interacted with Bitstamp, another exchange um, in Bitcoin. And what this is allowing you to do is to see who your counterparties are in this pseudonymous environment and assess you know, what the flows have been um, between these two exchanges. I can see that, in general, money has flown from, uh, from Kraken uh, to Bitstamp. And I can pull up every single individual transaction that has gone between those two entities. Um, now, what we can also do with this platform is uh, pull up some of the darker actors. So this might be intriguing for some. So Agora Market, how many people are familiar with Agora Market? Hands up. <laughs> OK. So Agora Market is a dark marketplace where you can buy stolen credit cards, drugs, um, you know, illegal goods. Uh, I expected all the hands to go up, really. Um, um, so um, essentially, the, the, these are businesses that you, you don't want to continue doing business with. And so places like Bitstamp and Kraken have compliance processes that allow them to detect suspicious activity and notify the authorities with suspicious, acti suspicious activity reports and CTRs. And essentially, we provide a full map from those services to the individual customers at Bitstamp that are responsible for making those transactions, allowing Bitstamp to essentially eliminate abuse from their platform. Um, we also provide the facility um, to track down cyber criminals. And I'll just show you a quick example. So this is something that I prepared earlier. Um, Bitcoin, uh, and, and you'll notice one thing that's, uh, for those who are familiar with compliance, I've shown no personal identifying information in this system, but yet we're able to still catch cyber criminals, still prevent abuse of these platforms in a completely radically new way than what typically happens in financial services where you expose social security numbers and you're just doing velocity and, and, um, and volume limits. So here we have, um, this is Prime Dice. Um, it's a gambling website, uh, provably, provably fair, which is kind of interesting for those people um, who are mathematically inclined. But they were DDoS attacked uh, and taken offline and charged a 20 Bitcoin ransom. And the ransom is paid to a Bitcoin address. And what we, what we help uh, people do is to find out you know, flows of funds going between different entities. And so I can see here, using this transaction, that Prime Dice, some people linked to Prime Dice, paid the ransom to this entity. This entity sent uh, the 20 Bitcoins onto another entity. Um, this was then transferred to a, a different wallet, trying to obscure the pattern. But then they reveal, essentially, that they are um, they are cashing out at an exchange. And at that point, we are able to identify who the person is um, and we can crack uh, the case. We've, we've cracked several cybercrime cases. We've been involved in um, very high profile cases associated with the Silk Road, which was another drug marketplace, and the two FBI agents that were actually embezzling money and extorting the, um, extorting the owner of the Silk Road for, information, uh, for money based on information associated with his case. Um, and um, I'll leave it with that. We have over 30 customers. We've only been in business a year, and we only have three developers. And that's time. <laughs>
have been having so far. So from a opportunities and benefits of, uh, perspective, uh, you can say that um, it's transparent, it's secure, it's decentralized, uh, cheap and quick and efficient and applicable to almost all, uh, all, the, uh, all the industries in the world. So that's why it's such a good thing. So the tools, what I have and what I also think that's, that's the whole purpose of you know, those FinTech kind of uh, conferences is that we really need to be innovative, which already has been said a lot, long, uh, a lot of times. We should not uh, try to you know, uh, be afraid for the new technology. We should really try to embrace it, uh, experiment with it, and also from a regulatory point of view, relax laws where it, it, you know, where it is possible and make sure that you have minimum standards for the requirements like KYC and anti-money laundering. Okay, that's it. Um, I know I, there is not that much time anymore, so 